we don't think much of Bangladesh's strategic significance. But I think the Chinese are seeing one that look, its economy is doing very well. There is more interest in collaboration with Bangladesh. Uh, today it's not just India is trying to rebuild the friendship, but US, Australia, Japan are all eager to engage Bangladesh. And Bangladesh sits in at the top of the Bay of Bengal. We are here again with uh, C. Raja Mohan, who is the contributing editor on foreign affairs for the Indian Express, as well as the director of the South Asia Institute of the Singapore National University. So this week, it's an interesting thing which your column takes off from China, usually in South Asia, specifically was seen as, a, as the benevolent friend vis-a-vis -vis India, which was seen Delhi, which was seen as much more imperial in the affairs of its neighbors, much more sort of high-handed. Uh, in Bangladesh, the Chinese ambassador was fairly rude saying unprompted it seems that uh, that in case Bangladesh even considers the quad for which there has been no indication uh, it, China will you know it will be detrimental to their relationship or something to that very threatening to it. what do you think has prompted this kind of thing all of a sudden from China which is not which was not in character no as I argue in the column I mean one this is the party line that the Chinese now have a party line which says, look, Quad is divisive. So anytime anybody asks them anything relating to Quad, they're going to give the full spiel that, that look, uh, it is a clique and uh, anybody who associates with them will have costs uh, with the with vis a vis-a-vis vis -a -vis China. So one level is just merely affirming the, the policy. Second, I think uh, he's uh, basically, I think, where India, you know, barring the express where we've had some articles on, you know, the strategic, the growing strategic importance of Bangladesh, uh, we don't think much of Bangladesh's strategic significance. But I think the Chinese are seeing one that look, its economy is doing very well. There is more interest in collaboration with Bangladesh. Uh, today, it's not just India is trying to rebuild the friendship, but US, Australia, Japan are all eager to engage Bangladesh. And Bangladesh sits in at the top of the Bay of Bengal, literal, uh, it is going to be more important. So they're basically telling them, they've also seen, the Chinese have also seen US uh, Deputy Secretary of State show up in Dhaka. Uh, there is uh, John Kerry showed up in Dhaka because of climate change. So they're basically seeing that, look, others are recognizing the importance of Bangladesh. And they're telling them, look, don't even think about it. So it is not that Bangladesh is joining today. It's not as if he doesn't know the situation. Or oh, he's basically saying, "Look, this is a red line. So just remember that." And that's where you remember know, in the column I point to 2007 when they told India, "Don't do multilateral exercise with U.S. and others." Uh, when we did this big five-nation uh, military exercise in the Bay of Bengal, and that created a problem for the UPA government. So when China says something like this in public. So the, the self-deterrence then on the governments is there. The weaker you are, the stronger the, uh, the constraints. So, so I think they expect people to stop because that's a whole strategy is preempt, preempt, preempt. Telling them don't do it so that even if Bangladesh is nowhere near it, it is a red line that they remember in dealing with China. Because Bangladesh buys a lot of arms from China. So it's not as if China has no, and they bought two submarines from them. Now, of course, Bangladesh is trying to diversify getting some more weapons from Russia. I think probably China wants to, doesn't want to, you know, go too far away from dependence on Chinese military cooperation. So, you know, another point you raise in the column, which I'd like you to elaborate on it, is a bit as if the smaller, so-called smaller countries of South Asia, I mean, apart from India, have been using, say, China to balance India, India to balance China, as is their right. I mean, that is their strategic leverage. Do you think... On alignment of a kind. Yeah, and now, and now if you, do you think that as time goes on, one of the things you mentioned in the column is interesting that it is not as though it's no cost anymore. The Chinese will assert, given the, the amount that they're doing, or whether it's money, whether it's arms, whatever it is, they will try to be more assertive, even in domestic politics, other decisions that countries might want to make. How do you think that the other regional, uh, other regional countries, Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, of course, is, is, is not in the reckoning, Sri Lanka, how do you think they will now look to balance? Do you think India can now be a little smarter? Delhi can be a little smarter in trying to get in there again without trying without, without being a big brother anymore, as it had once tried to be? Exactly. You know, one, I think the most South Asian countries say they are small, actually, barring Bhutan and Maldives. None of them others are small. Uh, even the 
other countries, each one of them, Sri Lanka, uh, Nepal, are fairly large populations. Bangladesh, of course, is huge. Uh, so this idea somehow it's all about small countries. They look small relative to India, but they're fairly reasonably uh, sized, uh, sized countries. So all these years, I mean, it was easy to just call on China to, to support them when they had problems with India, uh, when Sri Lanka, you know, on the Tamil question, so the Chinese gave them arms to fight the war, they supported them. Nepal, for example, now back, going back to the 60s. I mean, so they just started playing this game between uh, India, and, India and China. But India's relative weight was still much larger. But today, China's weight has grown. So China is, is going to say, now look, I mean, I like giving you a free lunch, but, but there are once in a while you got, to, there is a payback time. So when it tells Sri Lanka, look, uh, this project, uh, whatever the terms are, you've got to accept. So after all, uh, the previous government in Sri Lanka led by, uh, you know, where the, the, you know, the UNP, they were the ones who raised the question of the Chinese projects as being too costly, too expensive. But once they came to power, <laughs> they simply had to cede Chinese demand, and they gave a 99-year lease on the Hammadota port. Or similarly on Nepal, I mean, you've seen how the Chinese have interfered in the making of the, you know, the you know, keeping the Communist Party united, trying to keep the coalition showed up. And they put a lot of pressure on Nepal not to accept the US aid on the $500 million of assistance, which US is almost uh, giving it under, you know, uh, fairly reasonable, reasonable terms. So I think there is going to be pressure because Chinese are now playing for bigger states. So for them, it is preventing India or the US from gaining too much ground to set up their own system of rules in this part of the world. So they're not going to simply say, oh, we love you because you hate India. That phase is over. They're basically saying, okay, here we are. We give you a lot of assistance. We are your major trading partner. And we have interest too. So we're going to have demands. And those demands are going to be, have to be met. So the important thing, I think, you know, we should, as Indians, we should never tell the, our neighbors, look, having India even a little bit in your game gives you more room to play. Yeah. Because as a bite size, you are nothing for the Chinese. Yeah. Uh, so, so, but I think the, because they've got used to so much of this, you know, China is good, China is non-interventionist, while India is interventionist. But I think they're not fully mentally prepared to deal with the new rising China. Uh, which is going to be clear about in interest uh, and push for them with whatever means uh, means that it has. Then but India, as you said, I mean, that India, I think, look, I think we've already learned some lessons. Uh, like you said, in the recent crisis in Nepal, India was, Indian ambassador was not trying to, you know, the policy we used to have, which was banana, girana. Uh -huh. we, we thought we were making prime ministers and pulling them down. Now, Chinese have got the job, but we kept quiet. So I think it's better to play a low-key role in the in the neighborhood rather than trying to be some kind of a self-appointed boss uh, we're not the british Raj, so we're not going to be the boss so i think we must learn our limitations but yet, at the same time geography is with india we can do a lot of things with our neighbors focus on getting things done rather than uh, trying to show off that you are the regional boss and i think the chinese power is here so i think uh, if you're careful sensible uh, it'll create openings on its own without we having to preach uh, anything to our neighbors. So the final question, there's a, towards the end of the piece, which everyone should read, the link will be in the description wherever the video goes out. So in, the, in, in a bit, you said I an mean, interesting thing that earlier it was like you say, Chinese assistance, Chinese money was almost untied aid. I mean, it was something that we thought was coming that is changing. And the flip side was India's inefficiency, along with interference at completing projects. Along with this sort of, let's say, diplomatic maturity or subtlety, that Delhi is, seems to be getting and should continue to build on. Do you think there is still that old thing of if you're taking on projects, it's time to be able to finish them? Or, and maybe there's some room to do it as a consortium with our new friends in the re region and beyond. That, 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 that seems to be a big impediment even now, just getting, that, just getting the work yeah. done. I think the part of the problem India has had was to rely on the government agencies to negotiate contracts uh, that that I think we should encourage uh, that look tell the even when we're giving aid to Bhutan or Nepal on a hydroelectric project we should tell them look you go bid and these are the international standard norms of bidding you decide on that basis rather than an Indian joint secretary negotiating with them they standing up because they like their sovereignty mm -hmm. I think we need to get out of this uh, encourage them to go out get 
uh, you know, in, uh, encourage the Indian private sector to do more projects rather than uh, uh, letting, you know, the government try to micromanage the whole process. Uh, but then, even then, there are issues, of course. I mean, that you have uh, recently, Adani was given a contract uh, for the port in the one, you know, terminal in Colombo uh, port. Of course, that creates its own, our domestic politics. But the fact is, uh, after years of trying to get a contract, which we could not, and the Chinese have walked away, Chinese companies have walked away with many deals. So you have got to hear a deal, but whether they'll finally get through or not is not clear. But I think you must let our private sector, we have enough capabilities to do projects rather than government trying to run these projects. I mean, I think we made a mess of road building in Nepal, simple things where the government gets involved. If you can't do in your own country, I mean, <laughs> we shouldn't, yeah. we should have a different model at least where we put in good money for diplomatic and strategic purposes. Great, sir. Thanks a lot. Everyone, please read the piece. It has actually the details in the analysis in a much more in-depth manner. It's on the IndianExpress.com and, of course, on the e-paper in the print edition. Thank you so much, sir.